Good evening, everyone. I'm really honored and delighted to be here today and to be part of this uh, webinar series, the ASPITAR Sports Medicine Collection Forum Series. I think that we get a long road of discussing several joints, parts, and injuries that athletes face during their lifetime. And today we'll be talking about shoulder joints, its injuries, and its treatment with an amazing and top-level expert from all over the world. We are gathering today to discuss these injuries and to come up with the best plan that can increase our knowledge and to help us to serve our athletes in the best way. For practical reasons, we will take questions at the end of all the presentations so we can facilitate the discussion. Now it's my pleasure as the moderator of the session to present to you the speakers before each one's presentation. We'll start first with Dr. Mihu Tanaka. Dr. Mihu Tanaka is an orthopedic sports medicine surgeon and director of the Women's Sports Medicine Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She has served as a team physician for multiple professional, semi-professional, and collegiate sports teams, including St. Louis Cardinals, Boston Glory, Boston Ballet, and the U.S. Soccer Federation. She currently serves as the chair of multimedia for AOS, as well as an electronic media editorial board for AGSM, the editorial board for Arthroscopy Journal, the associate CME editor panel for GBGS, and editor-in-chief for Journal of Women's Sports Medicine. Dr. Tanaka will be talking about slab lesion, long head of biceps, tendon injury and treatment in overhead athletes. Dr. Tanaka. Thanks very much for the opportunity to give this talk today, uh, especially to Dr. Zakria, who's been such an instrumental part of my training uh, and my career development um, as a sports medicine surgeon and for all of his contributions uh, to the Hopkins uh, residents and faculty. So today I'll be talking about biceps and slap pathology uh, with a particular focus in overhead athletes. These are my disclosures. So as we know, slap tears are a term that was coined by Snyder due to the location of the tear patterns uh, in the superior labrum, including the anterior and posterior aspects of it. This occurs at the long head bicep tendon attachment to the labrum and was first described in 1985 by Andrews in overhead throwers. We know that slap lesions account for about 80 to 90 percent of labral pathology in the stable shoulder and that type 2 tears, which is a combined attachment in the labrum and biceps tendon, are the most common type that we see. I borrowed this slide from David Lintner because it it really accurately kind of covers the context of slap injuries uh, in sports medicine surgery. So in the 90s, uh, we hardly knew what this was. And in the 2000s, we started fixing it. But soon we started realizing that slap tears were everywhere and that everyone had them. Uh, and then we started realizing that they don't necessarily do that well after repairs. Um, and then over the past 10 years or so, we've leaned more uh, away from repairing slap tears. Uh, and I would say that in 2020 now, the focus is more on biceps tenodesis. So why do we think of this as the bicipital labral complex? Well, we know that it has three components uh, and it's all part of the same complex with the inside zone being the biceps anchor, including the long head biceps tendon and the superior labrum at its attachment um, at the supralenoid tubercle. The junctional zone includes the anterior tendon and the stabilizing pulley. And then the extra zone is where the bicipital tunnel is. It's enclosed by a fibral osseous sheath and it extends from the articular border to the subpectoralis region. Now the injuries can be categorized by these zones with the inside zone containing slap lesions and biceps tendon entrapment. Junctional injuries occurring typically in conjunction with subscapularis insufficiency, which, which can include biceps instability, pulley lesions, partial tears, and contramilatia, and extra-articular lesions involving scarring and stenosis, biceps instability, loose bodies, and partial tearing. Biceps pathology is important to recognize because we know that the biceps is a pain generator and can lead to post-operative pain. Sam Taylor's study looking at um, the most common risk factors for surgical failure of slap repairs 
was that a diagnosis of biceps tendonitis, tendonitis occurred at the time of surgery. Chris Camp showed in 2017 that biceps tendonitis was most commonly um, the most commonly occurring shoulder injury in baseball players. So we know that this population in particular is at risk. Now, why is this? Typically in the biomechanics, we see this during arm acceleration and deceleration. And we know that force applied along the long head biceps tendon reduces humeral head translation in both the anterior posterior and superior inferior directions. So this stabilizes the glenohumeral joint anteriorly during internal rotation and posteriorly during external rotation, especially around 45 degrees of abduction. We also know from Strauss's study that type 2 slap tears can cause increased glenohumeral translation. In the overhead athlete, we know that repetitive overhead motion can lead to a shift in the total arc of rotation. We refer to this as GERD when this is pathologic, and this is generally considered greater than 20 degrees compared to the contralateral state. Now we know that this is just uh, loss of the total arc of motion. Uh, however, loss of external rotation can also predispose to injury. In these athletes, it's the balance between having laxity for enough external rotation and stability to prevent subluxation, which is important, as too much laxity can lead to instability and can lead to bicipital labral complex lesions. In throwers, the etiology has been described in several ways. Andrews described that with arm deceleration during biceps contraction can lead to traction on the insertion of the, uh, the biceps tendon. Burkhart showed that repeated vertical posterior shifts in the long head biceps tendon angle during the cocking phase can lead to torsion and peel back. And we know that the forces are increased with disruption of the kinetic chain. So how do these patients present? Well, typically it's atraumatic with an insidious onset of anterior shoulder pain. Symptoms can be exacerbated with overhead activities. Um, pain can radiate down the anterior arm from the shoulder. Some patients report clicking or audible popping. They may have pain at rest or pain at night. Uh, and many pictures often describe the sensation of the dead arm. On examination, it's important to always check the neck uh, and to include the other side in terms of assessing for symmetry of motion, scapular motion, range of motion, uh, and looking also at tenderness, strength, assessing for uh, instability, as well as concomitant pathology and neurovascular function. In terms of the examination, I think through this session, uh, other parts of the examination will be covered. So I'll focus specifically on the ones that address the bicipital labral complex. I think we all know O'Brien's test, or also known as the active compression test, which has been shown to have a wide range of sensitivity and specificity. This is performed with the, app, with the arm uh, at 90 degrees of forward flexion and 10 degrees of adduction and internal rotation to have the thumb pointing down. The patient then is asked to resist a downward force, and then this is repeated with the pump up. A positive test is considered uh, positive if there's pain at the joint line during the initial maneuver, which is relieved with rest. Now, this part is really important to recognize because if you have posterior pain, um, then this can be related to the rotator cuff. Um, and additionally, with the adduction, you can um, you can trigger symptoms in the uh, AC joint as well. So it's important to recognize that it's joint line pain relieved by external rotation of the shoulder with this uh, to be considered a truly positive test. The anterior slide test has also been described, again, wide range of sensitivity. Um, this involves the arm um, being uh, on the hip with thumb pointing backwards um, and you can apply an axial load to the elbow in the anterior superior direction of the shoulder and this is considered a positive test if there's pain or click at the joint line with this maneuver. The Mayo shear test, also known as the modified Driscoll and, or the dynamic label shear test, has a sensitivity reported of 80%. This is where you have the patient actively adduct the shoulder to about 120 degrees, and then you externally rotate until there's resistance and then apply shear force by lowering the arm to about 60 degrees while maintaining full external rotation. And a positive test consists of a pain or click in the joint line posteriorly during this motion. The three-pack test was described by O'Brien uh, using three separate tests, including the active compression test, which in his study had a sensitivity of 95.7%. The throwing test in the 90-90 position is, can be shown in figure C. Uh, and then the palpation of the bicipital tunnel, which he reports, again, has high sensitivity. Um, in his study, he showed that if you have a negative active compression test and a negative um, no pain with uh, palpation of the bicipital tunnel, then the negative predictive value for bicipital tunnel lesions is 93 to 96%.
On imaging, uh, radiographs can be obtained. I think most people will go uh, to MRI for the diagnosis, but it's important to remember that sensitivity can vary and is not necessarily high on standard MRI. Um, Connolly showed that if you compare the reports from a radiologist uh, who is generally trained versus an MSK specialty trained, there's a difference in the sensitivity of identifying slap tears. So it's important to know who's reading your films as well. Uh, the improvement of sensitivity sensitivity can be uh, increased with the addition of intraarticular contrast, um, as well as positioning specifically with arm traction and external rotation. Um, a recent study out of Rush showed that the most cost-effective imaging is either a 3T MRI without contrast or a 1.5 Tesla MR Arthur RAM, uh, as both of these have been shown to have the fewest number of false positives as well. And false positives, as we know, is a common finding uh, on MRIs. In asymptomatic overhead throwers, there are multiple variations uh, that can be found on the MRI. And Schwartzberg showed in a study of asymptomatic patients between the ages of 45 and 60 that 72% of them had MRI documented slap lesions. So this is an asymptomatic shoulder. So this is a very common finding. Uh, and in a study of professional handball players, uh, it's been shown that 93% of these have some sort of MRI findings, but only a third of these are symptomatic. So this is where it's important to remember that the physical exam is key. It's not just about the finding uh, on the MRI, but you also need to include or exclude the presence of rotator cuff syndrome, um, shoulder impingement, and AC joint arthritis in this process. Once the diagnosis is established, non-operative treatment uh, can be the initial course of treatment with initial rest period uh, with a sport-specific timeline protocol. Anti-inflammatory medications are helpful and targeted ultrasound-guided injections uh, can be helpful as needed as well. The main point of the physical therapy is to address the underlying pathologic biomechanics that may have been present at the baseline. This includes scapulothoracic dyskinesia and posterior capsular contractions, <clears throat> with proprioceptive training of the shoulder girdle being very important important to prevent re-injury. After non-operative treatment in high-level overhead throwers, this has been shown to have equivalent return to play rates uh, when comparing operative versus non-operative modalities. Um, and the use of non-operative PT regimens uh, generally are to, con uh, sorry, to correct uh, scapular dyskinesia and internal rotation deficit, as previously discussed. And in a prospective study, this was shown uh, that the return of prior level of play was about 71% with non-operative treatment and slap tears, uh, but only 66% in overhead athletes. And this is a trend that we'll see uh, kind of going through um, all sorts of treatments, including operative ones. So in those who don't do well with non-operative treatment, uh, they may undergo uh, surgery, and this can be a slap repair. So this is performed arthroscopically. Multiple techniques have been described for this. The anchor design and the position of the anchors really hasn't been shown to be associated with complications. However, there's one study that shows that knotted anchors have a slightly higher complication rate versus knotless anchors. Regardless of the technique, the goal here is to eliminate the peel back and restore the normal mechanics of the shoulder by attaching the biceps anchor to the glenoid. In this systematic review of how these slap repairs do, uh, this showed that there isn't a lot of high level uh, evidence with regard to level one or level two evidence after slap repairs. And there's a wide range of results uh, with good to excellent results ranging from 40 to 94%. Um, return to prior level of play has an even wider range with the worst results in overhead athletes. Overall, if they're a non-throwing sport or a non-overhead athlete, then the overall re results are generally excellent, um, but in overhead athletes, much less predictable. Looking specifically at baseball players after slap repairs, uh, even with position, this can vary. So this was a study retrospectively looking at out outcomes after an isolated slap repair and found a 62% return to play rate lower in pitchers than in position players. Uh, and for those who were able to return to the same level uh, compared to their pre-injury, these numbers were even lower, 43% in pitchers and 66% percent in position players. Um, overall, there were no differences between the type of procedure that was performed with this uh, or the level of play.
looking specifically at baseball players, we see the same sorts of numbers and really comparing non-operative treatment to slab repair, especially in pitchers, there isn't a big difference. And in fact, you could say that those with slab repairs were worse in terms of returning to their uh, prior level of play. For position players, they tended to do better with surgical treatment than non-operative treatment. But again, the numbers are not high. Um, overall, with all of these, if they had an associated rotator cuff tear, their outcomes were much worse. Looking at um, the outcomes after slab repair, uh, the revision rate is about 2.5%, and the highest rate of um, <clears throat> having a subsequent uh, failure was a diagnosis of biceps tendonitis or biceps tendon tear at the time or before surgery. And this is why it's important to look at the biceps overall and consider this as a complex. The biceps tenotomy can address this, and this releases the biceps tendon. Um, this removes the tension on the injured uh, bicepital labral complex. The advantages of this are that it's a quick procedure. There's adequate relief of pain and return to activity. However, this has been associated with soreness, cramping, and fatigue, and potentially decreased elbow flexion supination strength, as well as the Popeye sign, which is is cosmetically not desirable for some patients. The alternative is biceps tenodesis, and this has really increased in popularity as the primary treatment for slap tears over the past several years. Uh, this is helpful because it also decompresses the biceps tunnel, and this can be performed as a proximal tenodesis, an open subpectoral tenodesis, even an arthroscopic subdeltoid biceps transfer, as um, Steve O'Brien has described. Revision rate overall is about 3%, mostly in the younger population. So how do these patients do? Well, we know that in patients over the age of 40, they do great with the biceps tenodesis for slap tears. Um, but in younger patients, uh, now there's more literature on how well they do. So this is looking at biceps pathology and a tenodesis in ages under 25 shows good results, uh, even in overhead sports with a return to prior level of play of 77%. So this is much better than we've seen previously uh, with slap repairs. If you do a biceps tenodesis and look specifically at isolated slap lesions in young patients, um, this also shows 73% return to prior level of play. And in overhead athletes specifically, a sub-analysis sub shows 80%. So again, these numbers are looking much better. This systematic review has compared slap repairs versus tenodesis for uh, the surgical treatment of isolated slap lesions, and again, favors tenodesis. And part of the reason may be that uh, this biomechanical study looking at um, kinematics after a biceps tenodesis versus slap repair in pitchers uh, showed that those with tenodesis more closely had restored normal pattern of muscular activation within the longhead biceps than did those with a slap repair, and that those with slap repairs had significantly altered thoracic rotation and were less likely to have normal values for a lead knee flexion at front foot contact during their throwing motions. In comparing the different types of tenodesis, uh, suprapectoral versus open subpec, generally there hasn't been shown to be a difference in terms of outcomes, residual pain, or biceps deformity. Uh, there is one study that shows a slightly higher complication rates uh, look in the open group uh, versus the arthroscopic suprapec group uh, with higher reoperation, wound complications, and nerve injury, although the rates were low in both groups. Um, the meta-analysis looking specifically at three papers showed no differences in both groups. So in summary, the prevalence of slap tears are much higher in throwers, but are not always symptomatic. And it's important to address the posterior capsular contractures and dynamic stabilization um, to lead to improved outcomes with non-operative treatment. Surgery is reserved for those who fail rehabilitation, uh, but surgical treatment in throwers doesn't necessarily lead to high rates of return to play. With surgical treatment, the options may vary, uh, but generally lower rates of return to play, especially in pitchers, it's important to consider and address biceps pathology, and when you do, the techniques are generally comparable. Overall, further studies are needed to identify the optimal surgical candidates um, as well as the optimal procedures to really um, optimize the rates of return to play. And at this point, we know that repair may not always be the best answer for these patients. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tanaka, for this uh, rich uh, presentation. Uh, for patients with the slab tears, usually we have to look at the whole complex of the biceps and to know the age, the history, and what kind of a sport those players play at.
Now, swiftly, we move on to the next speaker, Professor Greg Batoni. Dr. Batoni is an orthopedic sports surgeon from the United States. Currently, he serves as the Chief of Sports Medicine and the Director of Research at Tribler uh, Army Medical Center in Hawaii. He used to be the Chief of Surgery and Assistant to CMO here in Aspital in 2007. Dr. Batoni research accomplishments include the Aircast Award for Clinical Science in 2000 from the AOSSM. In 2005, he won the AOSSM Excellence in Research Award, and in 2007, he won the prestigious AOSSM O'Donoghue Sports Injury Research Award. He previously served as the president of the Society of Military Orthopedic Surgeons, and he was the president of the Hawaii Orthopedic Association. Professor Batoni will be talking about the management of rotator cuff tears. Dr. Batoni. Good evening or good morning from Hawaii. I am Dr. Craig Batani, Professor and Chief of Sports Medicine at the Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu. We're going to talk today about management of rotator cuff tears, primarily surgical management. This is a large topic that we're not going to be able to spend uh, the kind of time that we need to discuss all the nuances of rotator cuff pathology. But this is for the Aspitar Sports Medicine online forum series, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Again, I'm the Chief of Sports Medicine at Tripler Army Medical Center and the Director of Residency Research. This is located, for many of you who don't know, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, as shown in the map here with the Hawaiian Islands circled. And there are over 137 small, uh, mostly small islands with eight major islands. Uh, Oahu, uh, on which Tripler is located, is the most populous of all the Hawaiian Islands. As you don't know, I was the first chief of surgery and assistant chief medical officer at Aspitar when we opened in 2007 through 2009. Uh, and here are some pictures from that time. Dr. Peter Fowler on the upper left is our first chief medical officer. Uh, all of you know Dr. Nebo Popovich, my good friend. And then on the bottom, Cristiano and Hakeem were still uh, at Aspitar. So anatomy of the rotator cuff, as you all know, there are four muscles of the rotator cuff, the subscapularis innervated by the upper and lower subscapular nerve. There are the supra and infraspinatus muscles, both innervated by the suprascapular nerve and the teres minor. And on the right is a diagrammatic representation of those insertions, the blue being the lesser tuberosity and the insertion of the subscapularis, the green being the suprascapular uh, innervated supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. And lastly, in dark red, the teres minor, which is a smaller insertion on the uh, posterior aspect of the proximal humerus. Although a lot of variability exists in the manifestation or clinical presentation of rotator cuff tears, typically there's an anterior lateral and proximal arm pain or up in the proximal shoulder. It's usually insidious in onset, and there's usually a painful arc from 70 to 120 degrees. The pain is usually associated with activities above shoulder level, and there can be a weakness, especially in extra rotation, but be careful of the frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis if the pain is located below this uh, level. Night pain is fairly common, and then patients may complain of interrupted sleep with a rotator cuff tear. Of course, we're going to first proceed with non-operative management, we need to make sure we rule out other etiologies, and these can be vast. There is a Parsonage-Turner, which is a, a neuropathy, a cervical radiculopathy, and many others which we can't uh, go into in this time frame today, but we have to make sure that uh, there are other things that are ruled out besides going right, right to a rotator cuff tear. Of course, physiotherapy and non-operative management is the mainstay uh, primarily in treatment. Range of motion and strengthening our goals with physiotherapy. If an MRI, if a suspected rotator cuff tear, an MRI is then the next imaging study to ascertain whether there truly is a, a reparable rotator cuff tear. And then surgery for failure of non-operative management is the next step for uh, rotator cuff pathology. And these are MRI images demonstrating the tear of the rotator cuff, specifically the supra and infraspinatus as it inserts onto the greater tuberosity. Talk uh, initially about the subscapularis tears. You have to have a high index of suspicion to diagnose these. 
An MRI is typically diagnostic and shows it in the axial and sagittal oblique cuts, the tear as is shown here in the black arrow where the subscapularis will insert. Typically on the lesser tuberosity, it may be ruptured, there may be a partial tear, and you want to look for a long head of the biceps, which normally is located in the intertubercular groove, which may be subluxated outside the groove or in some cases into the tendon of the subscapularis, demonstrating incompetence of those fibers. These are more difficult to see with the 30 degree arthroscope when we actually look at these uh, diagnostically. You may need a 70 degree arthroscope to look around the corner of the humeral head as the arthroscope is typically inserted into the posterior aspect of the glenohumeral joint. You also can use what's called a lever push maneuver where you actually pull the head posteriorly while, while visualizing uh, with the arthroscope. This is described by Steve Burkhart and is allowed to better maneuver the scope and visualize the lesser tuberosity. You can also use a dynamic assessment to better appreciate the pathology. Most tears are, are located just the superior aspect of the subscapularis tendon. There may also be a thickened middle glenohumeral ligament, diagnosing sort of an internal impingement as it can cut across the uh, rotator cuff muscle, the subscapularis muscle and tendon. You have to be aware of a coracochromial distance. There can be impingement of the, the uh, coracoid and less than eight millimeters is considered abnormal for the distance between the tip of the coracoid and the humeral head. And this can also ask, act as an internal, uh, in, I'm sorry, an external impingement of the subscapularis. Usually a bicep tenotomy or tenodesis is performed due to a tendon injury, subluxation, and to improve visualization while performing a subscapularis repair. We need to be aware of regional nerve vascular anatomy when we're doing this surgery as the brachial plexus and other nerves are in close proximity. Typically one anchor is utilized per one centimeter of subscapularis tendon tears. And again, a high index of suspicion should be utilized for subscapularis uh, injury. You need to look for them or, they'll or you definitely will miss them. Uh, we talked about the different uh, techniques using a 70 arthroscope or lever push to identify these. Different portal anatomy can be utilized uh, and uh, we can scare the tendon back with high strength suture tape back to the lesser tuberosity when torn. Primarily, however, we're talking with rotator cuff tears about the superior rotator cuff. We need to, we need to result in reproducible strong surgical techniques to allow for a secure fixation to bone, allow gradual restoration of the normal tendon and insertional anatomy with little, if any, residual hardware. These are the strategies of rotator cuff repair when we do have a reparable uh, rotator cuff tear. Uh, first, we're going to allow for visualization. We need to be able to see what we're doing and identify the tear. Uh, to do this, we need access, portal, por por proper, proper portal placement, and we'll talk about that. We need to identify the tear configuration, specific tears that occur of the rotator cuff. We then need to mobilize the tissue, place our anchors, and complete our repair as shown here. So visualization is, is first and foremost. Uh, the diagram and, uh, and video on the left demonstrates a uh, electrocautery device in the subacromial space. So the rotator cuff is below us, the acromion is above us, and we're doing a, a subacromial decompression where we're eliminating or ablating the soft tissue, including these, the coracoacromial ligament. Next, we're going to use a burr to smooth down the acromion. The acromion has been described to be three separate types of morphology, a flat, a curved and a hooked acromion, which can contribute to external rotator cuff pathology. Once that's smoothed down, we can move on to visualization and um, repair. Uh, it's important to maintain hemostasis throughout this procedure, as just a small amount of blood can severely uh, hamper the ability to see within the subacromial space. So visualization in hemostasis. Next, portal placement access and ability to put the, the uh, arthroscope into the correct bill to see. This is a busy slide here demonstrating the portal placement. The standard posterior portal is shown here where we first start to look at the glenohumeral joint as well as the standard anterior portal where we do most of our instrumentation into the glenohumeral joint. Once we move up into the subacromial space which is above the rotator cuff and below the acromion we then can move our arthroscope into a more anterior position 
which is the posterior lateral rotator cuff viewing portal demonstrated here. We then can insert a cannula into the posterior standard portal. And then lastly, we can create a midline portal for instrumentation. We'll talk about that in just a minute. This is just a percutaneous approach to utilize for anchor placement, especially if we're doing a, a double row repair. We'll access the medial row of the rotator cuff during placement. Poor portal technique demonstrates the posterior normal joint evaluation portal or uh, anterior instrumentation portal for the glenohumeral joint. And the move the scope. The scope is then moved to the posterior lateral portal for viewing, for better viewing of the rotator cuff. Then there's this mid lateral uh, portal. We call this the 50 yard line view to allow for direct in instrumentation. The 50 yard line view comes from American football, which is 100 yards long. So it's basically midline, uh, mid uh, viewing perspective of this portal. Next, we need to identify the tear configuration. Different types of tears, and these diagrams demonstrate the crescent shaped tear, which is simply a tear which pulls away from the tuberosity. And then there's the L or reverse L shaped tears, where there's actually displacement of the rotator cuff either posteriorly or anteriorly, uh, depending on the pull of and the initial tear. And these diagrams demonstrate those in a cadaver. Here's the crescent tear, and the, the probe is placed on the type of uh, the, the area of the tear, which we replaced or repaired back to the tuberosity. There's a U shaped tear where the initial closure, like a tent, might need to be closed down first before that tissue can be taken to the tuberosity. And last, the L shaped tear, where the uh, point of the tear marked in blue needs to be repaired back to the tuberosity. Uh, mark blue here, and then the rest is done with a side-to-side -side closure. You see there's no way to bring this medial aspect of the rotator cuff to the tuberosity, and proper identification of these tears is paramount. These are some pictures intraoperatively demonstrating these types of tears. It's very V-shaped, almost like a tent, and then another large tear where first a side-to-side -side closure needs to be performed before the rotator cuff can be repaired, and here is the rotator cuff with the exposed uh, articular surface of the glenohumeral joint. Next, we need to mobilize tissue. So once we identify the tear, we're going to replace our tears and do the completed repair. So we're going to pass uh, sutures through the rotator cuff. And uh, suffice to say, there are different ways of doing this, but we're going to pass sutures through the cuff and bring those edges of the tear back down to the tuberosity, securing them uh, to uh, on bone. And here again, you see the rotator cuff tear, you see a punch going into the bone, and then a biocomposite or absorbable suture anchor going into the bone with the attached sutures. The repair is shown here diagrammatically. We have a medial row anchors, two sutures, blue and white, and these are actually suture tapes. So they're a little broader uh, uh, width than the regular suture. And these are then secured on the lateral aspect of the tuberosity for a compressive double row repair. Here are two anchors placed medially and then a single anchor placed laterally for a smaller tear. These are double row compressive. Uh, uh, and these are just shown intraoperatively with the anchors again being inserted and the final construct with the two blue anchors, I'm sorry, two blue sutures and the two blue and the two white sutures for the double row repair. So in conclusion, you need a correct diagnosis. We need to make sure that the rotator cuff is the source of the pain, and there may not be other pain generators or other etiologies. You need to have preoperative or initially rehabilitation with physiotherapy. If they fail such physiotherapy and non-operative management, we're going to move forward with acceptable surgical indications with strong, secure cuff repair, and then appropriate postoperative rehabilitation. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, uh, Aspatar, Dr. Popovich, uh, for the opportunity to speak today uh, from Hawaii, and then we'll be following with questions uh, and uh, other uh, issues as necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Tony, for this uh, great talk. Uh, for rotator cuff tears, uh, there is a rule of uh, uh, conservative treatment, and if surgery is indicated, we need a, a secure watertight repair construct. So now uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Bashir Zakaria. Dr. Zakaria is the current chief of surgery for Asbitar. Uh, 
He was previously at John Hopkins School of Medicine in the US, where he has been an associate professor for orthopedic for the past 13 years and serves as the director of sports medicine education and articular cartilage restoration program. He specializes in cartilage restoration and upper extremity surgery. Dr. Zakaria will be talking about a very interesting topic today. I can call it the dilemma of the AC joint separation. When to treat surgically and when to consider conservative treatment and exactly what's the best surgical way. Dr. Bashir, please. So uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Dr. Popovich and uh, Dr. Khalid uh, Khalifi. Uh, this is a, I've been at Aspatar now eight months. Uh, it's been a great experience and I'm learning a lot from all the surgeons and I appreciate uh, them inviting me to do this talk. I'm talking about AC joints, their current concepts in treatment. Uh, as Dr. Khalid says, it can be, uh, a lot of people think it's a small joint, but it can actually be an important joint and it's important to understand uh, everything about this joint as well. So my objectives are to review the anatomy and biomechanics of the chromioclavicular joint, which we call the AC joint, learn a little bit about diagnosis and imaging, current treatment options, non-operative, and uh, surgical indications. I think the most important part of this talk will be to find out whom we operate on. It's, uh, I think, uh, the most controversial thing about this topic, and it's important to understand whom we operate on. And then I'll talk a little bit about distal clavicle fractures at the end, because you can't talk about AC joint injuries without a little bit discussing a little bit about the uh, distal clavicle. Uh, the AC joint is the uh, primary link in upper extremity uh, suspension. It actually connects the scapula to the uh, uh, clavicle and the clavicle and the AC joint kind of control the, the stability of the scapula. Uh, it's involved in about 30 to 50% of athletic injuries. And what we know about the AC joint, it's non-surgical management is always faster to return. Uh, but however, 15 to 20% of these patients have persistent pain. And then surgery is controversial, but before you understand what surgical procedure you do, or if you're going to do surgery, you got to understand the anatomy and the function of this joint. The AC joint itself is a diarthroidal joint. It has an intraarticular disc. It's incongruent, but it has ligaments that, call, that help it with stability. And this, this intraarticular disc loses, uh, it's, uh, it disintegrates by time to age 40. The, stabiliz the stabilizing structures of the AC joint are the AC ligaments and the coracoclavicular uh, ligaments. Uh, they have two components to the coracoclavicular ligaments. We call it the conoid and a trapezoid, and we'll discuss a little bit about this. Uh, it also involved in, the, in this uh, joint, and when we talk about the pathology, is the deltoid trapezial fascia. And you have to know that it has about five to deg eight degrees of motion in the scapular thoracic motion and with shoulder abduction it can it can rotate about 40 to 45 degrees motion as well uh, one of the thing uh, topics that have uh, been addressed recently is the ac ligament complex we used to just call them the ac ligaments now we call it an ac ligament complex the posterior and superior aspect of the ac ligament complex is the strongest and most biomechanically important this is usually uh, one of the questions that we used to be asked on our boards in OIT, but this posterior and superior AC ligaments are the strongest and biomechanically most important. They primarily restrain anterior and posterior translation and the horizontal plane. If we cut these AC ligaments, if they're transected in the horizontal plane, we have less than 25 degree, uh, percent of the native motion. That's the, CT, the CC ligaments only can retain less than 25% of the motion, uh, stability of that. However, when we reconstruct this ligament, we, do, we don't do a great job, but we do a decent job when we reconstruct it and we get to uh, stabilize it about 70% of the native ligaments. Isolated AC ligament complex injuries can cause superior displacement as well, up to 50% superior displacement. However, the one area where we are not good at, and when you and they uh, do the best with stability, is in posterior uh, uh, rotational. Uh, when your scapula protracts, you get this posterior rotation, and you can get significant instability if you cut the AC ligaments. Uh, 
you get less than 10% of the native stability. The CC ligaments don't do a good job at all at, uh, pre uh, at pre uh, preventing this rotational instability. And our reconstruction methods are, are not very good. With less than 45%, we uh, restore this native rotational stability. Uh, if you one of the things you, you should look at, the reason they, the rotational stability is so important is by the oblique nature of these ligaments. It's about a 30 degrees oblique obliquity to this ligament. The coracoclavicular ligaments are important for vertical stability. We have a posterior medial one called the conoid, and then we have one anterior lateral called the trapezoid. One of the things I like to talk about is the conoid and trapezoid should not be treated as one structure. They both have their functions and they should be treated uh, separately during reconstructions. The most common mechanism of injury, the most common cause of injury is a fall on, a, on the point of the shoulder. It's a direct injury. The chromium is driven downward and medially. Indirectly, it can be fallen on a flexed elbow and the humeral head is driven superiorly. They present with pain, focal tenderness. You can actually see a grossly palpable displacement of the AC joint. And physical exam is very important because we usually just examine the AC joint. However, you always have to look at scapular function. This, kind, this will help aid in treatment and management of the AC joint injury. Examine, I usually examine the patient while sitting or standing because uh, you have gravity working toward, for you. You can palpate and get direct pain and point the of the AC joint. You can feel the AC joint. You can see the AP translation or you can also perform a cross-arm adduction test, which can cause pain. Another thing you can look at is also to determine sometimes between a three and a five, where you can shrug the shoulders and a three usually reduces, and you can look at the reducibility of this separation. As far as scapular motion, you should look at upward and downward flexion, scapular position with manual reduction to AC joint, scapular assist test, and perform a scapular retraction test as well. The uh, imaging, we look at bilateral views, uh, AP views, axillary is excellent for the type four, type AC separation, we'll discuss, scapular Y, and then they call a Basmanian or a, a Alexander type view, which is a cross arm adduction view. If you see the overriding clavicle, it demonstrates an unstable to horizontal stability. There's also described in a lot of uh, literature, the Zanka view, which is just a 10 to 15 degree cephalic view, a cephalic uh, aim of the uh, beam view. Uh, it kind of isolates the AC joint. Another thing is when you're doing these AP views, lateral views, you should do it at one third penetration. We don't do stress views and they're not recommended because they generally do not help. Classification wise, we have six types of AC joint separations that we are classified based on the Rockwood classification. Type one and two, just a sprain of the AC ligaments or a tear of the AC ligaments is type two. Type three is a complete AC dislocation, complete disruption of ACCC ligaments, a tri delta trapezial phase is intact. You only have 25 to 100% displacement. It's been further classified by the Isikos uh, consensus on AC joints uh, to a 3A is a stable, a 3B is horizontally unstable. It, it's called, and you have included in this, a scapular dysfunction is a 3B, or when you look at a Basmania or Alexander view, you see an overriding uh, of the clavicle. Type Three, the delta trapezial fascia is intact. Type five, the delta trapezial fascia is not intact. Type four is complete AC dislocation with posterior displacement. AC and CC ligaments are torn. Type five is similar to a type three, but you also get detachment of the, uh, of the clavicle from the deltoid and the trapezius muscles. Significant, we say it's greater than 100% displacement. Type six is just for you know, to completion, but I've never seen it, and it's rarely even described, inferior to the uh, coracoid. So what's the treatment method? The Isikos consensus showed that you have an AC joint injury, this algorithm. You look at clinical exam and radiographical ev evaluation. So we all agree that type 1 and 2 don't need surgery. Type 3 is the one that's most controversial. Type four, five, and six, just for con to completion, are usually the ones we describe as surgical treatment by most uh, consensus.
Type three is the one that's most uh, variable, but generally we, we initially do this non-operative treatment, non-surgical, and then for, uh, later on, if they're having persistent pain, then we consider possibly doing surgery. There are some indications for surgical management in a type three, and I'll discuss a little bit further. Non-operative modalities include just putting a, split, uh, a sling and early range of motion, rehab, Return to sports is usually at four to six weeks, um, much faster than surgical. As I've said, the biggest questions in throwers, Jimmy Andrews talks about posterior angle pain in throwers. He recommends surgical for throwers. It's, he says it's an indication for surgery. He says as the thrower gets in the abduction external rotation position, the posterior part of the clavicle can impinge on the scapular spine. Uh, you can get a cosmetic deformity as well, with a type three non-operative treatment. However, non-operative to operative treatment, there's little functional difference in results among non-operative. Uh, there's uh, been a uh, randomized control trial, oper open reduction of terminal suspension fixation confers no functional benefit over non-operative treatment at one year. However, they did have a substantial number of patients that was not statistically significant that had unsatisfactory results that needed surgical repair. So as far as treatment, surgical treatment, there's over 60 surgical procedures. I've seen uh, literature that says over 100 procedures, but there's no been uh, no uh, really uh, ideal procedure. Uh, most of us start treating these patients non-operatively. This is another uh, clinical uh, secondary part. After the three to six weeks of non-operative treatment, you can continue. If you continue to have pain, then you do a cross-body arm adductor, adduction view. And then if you see an override in clavicle, you consider a 3B, you can opt for surgical treatment. No override in clavicle, we continue non-operative treatment. If it fails continued non-operative treatment, you may consider for surgery. So usually around three to six weeks, I see the patient back. After the first week, I treat them non-operatively. At three to six weeks, I see the patient back. If they, I need to do a basmanian view or clinically the scapular has dysfunction, then I may consider surgical in the dominant arm. Non-dominant arm, I rarely proceed with the secondary seeing him in three to six weeks. I usually see him at six weeks and go from there. So again, surgical treatment, not many indications for acute surgical invention. Non-dominant, like I mentioned, I rarely operate on. Uh, in my career, maybe once or twice, but very rarely. Even in type fives and fours, uh, cruel show that they still have satisfactory results if you treat them non-operatively. As I said, type three is con controversial. Uh, Type 3B, with the ones that have significant horizontal instability, we may uh, consider surgery early on because one third of them have abnormal throwing if you don't treat them. So what are the surgical principles? Reduction and stabilization of the distal clavicle. You either use a suspension device, and then if it's greater than four weeks, in my opinion, if it's greater than three weeks, you need some type of biological uh, sling or augmentation along to uh, help with the rec with the repair or reconstruction. And we recommend also to reconstruct the AC ligament complex, either with the either with the tendon coming across the AC joint, which is a good way to reconstruct it. Doesn't do well with posterior inst uh, rotational instability, but it does help with uh, about at least uh, with uh, horizontal instability. And you want to overcorrect at least by 50%. Study showed in OJSM, excellent results and no complications at two years. So what are our results? The Canadian Orthopedic Science DASH scores were better in non-surgical group at six, months, six, six weeks, but normalized at six months. Uh, there are the studies that show that our surgical repair does help and improves. They recommend the suspension device and arthroscopically assisted, slightly better than mini open, but essentially the same. But the one thing you have to know is that surgical management has up to a 30% complication rate. If you look at all the studies, the surgical management always had more complication rate. So you have to be sure whom you're going to operate on. So types of CC ligament reconstruction. Uh, the most common is the, is the uh, Mazaka technique by Dr. Mazaka at of Yukon. He does the two tunnels. It's called an anatomic ligament reconstruction. Make a posterior medial tunnel and anterior lateral tunnel. Use a graft. Use a graft. Uh, 
This is one that we did open. This is an open procedure. One of the things I want to highlight here, take if you are going to do a distal clavicle resection, try to take as minimal as possible. Just take that arthritic part as minimal as possible because you do not want to disrupt that capsule because you want to be able to repair that capsule as well. You pass a graft and then you fix it with the screws uh, into the, the tunnels are fixed with interference screws and and then and then you uh, bring this graft over and fix the AC uh, ligaments. The other technique is doing arthroscopic assisted. It's the way I do it. You make three portals anteriorly, uh, one anterior lateral, and then one posteriorly. You look, at, you go through the interval, you look at the coracoid, I find the coracoid, and then I pass my graft arthroscopically. I make a small incision over the clavicle, make my two drill tunnels, bring my screws in again, and do uh, my interference screw, and then fix my AC uh, ligaments along with it. This is one I did arthroscopically, and I, well, you can see my two tunnels. However, I switched. Now I do it without tunnels because I feel I, I always worry about fractures. I did have a couple tunnel widening when I was doing it with the other procedure. Uh, I, I was using allograft. You can use autograft or allograft. One of the issues I do have with allograft, you sometimes you get more wide uh, tunnel widening. So I've been doing it now with the the way Peter Millet does, and he's described it. You, uh, I put a button as a, a suspensory mechanism, and then I pass my graft, and then I tie my graft over the button on top. I bring the graft from the posterior and anterior lateral, posterior medial and anterior lateral, not through tunnels, and then I tie them and suture them and lock them. One of the things I do want to talk about is the AC ligament complex. As we know, most of our repair techniques are not very good, less than 50% uh, success with controlling posterior rotation. Dr. Mazaka showed us, uh, published his paper showing about a dermal patch. It's a little more complicated. It's, it's a significantly complicated procedure that you put a dermal patch to recreate the superior and posterior ligaments as well as coming anteriorly. And it, it had the best success as far as controlling posterior rotation and translation. You do a post-op protocol, a sling six weeks, strengthening exercise begin at six weeks. Usually full contact goes about six months to nine months. I just want to talk a little bit about distal clavicle fractures just because we're talking about AC joint injuries. Uh, they have a bimodal distribution between 30 to 50 and 70 above 70. They're 10 to 20% of all clavicle fractures. The thing you have to know about, they're unstable. Uh, the ones that are in the two uh, grade, uh, grade two B category or grade two categories, and they have a high non-union rate, and there's no gold standard for treatment. The near classification describes it based on the cor uh, coracoid um, and the coracoclavicular ligaments, type one's lateral, type two A's medial to the ligaments, type two B is the Conway's torn, and then three, four, and five are just a little uh, with uh, differences as far as comminuted, physis or lateral to the ligaments. The better classification for treatment is the choke classification. He published a paper in Current Concepts of Classifications of Distal Clavicle Factors. I like his better because type one is always non-operative. It's minimal displacement. Type two, 2B, two are similar to the concept of near classification. However, a 2C is not in a near classification, which includes this. And the type 2D is like the uh, type 5 in a near classification, but the 2C is important. We know type 1, non-operative, 2A, and on operative. And this is his um, algorithm, which he's shown. The one thing you have to know is if you're medial to the, uh, to the uh, ligaments, you can use a plate. Everything else pretty much you'll need except for 2D. If the ligaments are not intact, you have to use like a suspensory device to help. So type type one and three in the near classification are non-operative, and type one in the choke classification is non-operative. Non-union rate is high in type twos, uh, and you get poor cosmesis. And the return if you go non-operative, it return to place by 10 to 12 weeks, and you get at least Robbins showed a 14% uh, non-union rate. It's been as high as 33%, so 45%. Type two unstable, displays greater than five millimeters. You want gu the guidelines for acute injury. So what you have to know if you're gonna, if you have a type two and it's unstable, you need to have a pre-contoured plate. And if you have any CC ligament involvement, you need a circlage or a terminal suspension device. Outcomes, 
Uh, Vargas et al. I used to work with them. Uh, they showed 15 studies, 94% bony union with an arthroscopic fixation device. O et al. did a systemic review. This is the classic article with the non-union, 33% non-union if you do not fix them. However, in the surgical group, only 1.6% non-union, but you had a 22% complication rate. And then the last is Bonard, who met it out, says, with a CC fixation with plate and screw should be your first and second line, as I mentioned before. This is another case. It's a distal clavicle fracture. I would call this a 2B. You can see that the, I would say the trapezoid is intact, the conoid is uh, uh, torn. And then you can see I did it arthroscopically with the uh, identifying the um, Coracoid, you see, again, the coracoid, I drilled my pin through, flipped my button, and then I also put a plate on it to fix it. Usually, now I put the plate on top, and this one at that time, I was putting the button to see if I could reduce it, but I still was a little concerned, so then I also threw a plate, contoured plate on top. What do we know about the AC joint? Non-dominant, non-surgical, type three, conservative, assess at week three, get a basmanian view, or uh, also check the scapular function. Arthroscopic assisted and surgical procedures have 20 to 40% associated injuries. Uh, surgery, they did a study uh, to see what the different treatment strategies are. One surgeons did in type one and two, 99% were non-op. Type four and five, 96% were surgical. And as you can see, it was a flip of the coin for type three. Distal clavicle one and three are non-surgical. Type two can be treated non-operative in middle and older age population. Significantly high non-union rate can be painful and stable. I like to show classification for treatment and surgical management. And if you're gonna do it surgically, if the CC ligaments are torn, you need a cerclage or some type of terminal suspension device. And then also with a contoured plate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bashir, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. Now we swiftly move on to the next speaker, Dr. Tanya Bizari. Dr. Bizari is a physiotherapist and a clinician researcher from the Latrobe Sports and Exercise Medicine Research Center. She continues to work clinically as a physiotherapist and is the director of a practice in Melbourne, Australia. She has more than 120 peer-reviewed publications in the area of sports medicine and physiotherapy. Tanya is a member of a shoulder and elbow physiotherapist of Australia and teaches courses on the assessment and management of shoulder injuries in Australia and internationally. Dr. T Dr. Tanya is going to talk about posterior shoulder instability, misdiagnosed, misunderstood, and mistreated. Dr. Tanya. Hello, Dr. Khaled. Many thanks to you and your team for the invitation to present tonight. For my presentation, I'm going to focus on posterior shoulder instability, since in my clinical experience, it is misdiagnosed, misunderstood and mistreated. I think it's much more common than what is acknowledged in the literature and can, be a real, can create quite some difficulty for the clinician in terms of diagnosis and treatment. And we're currently undertaking some research in this area that I'll touch on during this presentation. I've no conflicts of interest to disclose and I will not be discussing any drugs or products in this presentation. So posterior instability is considered to account for less than 10% of all shoulder instabilities, but the incidence is, is likely underestimated, not least because even dislocations are missed on initial examination. And that may be a result of a low level of clinical suspicion. So the belief that most shoulders actually dislocate anteriorly, so we may not even be looking for it. And only 12% require reduction. So many people don't actually present to emergency or to the hospital. And so given that prevalence data are based on hospital data, it's perhaps not surprising that the reported incidence is quite low. And then we need to make sure that um, imaging is adequate to be able to um, get a true diagnosis. And so an AP film alone is not adequate to rule out a posterior dislocation, as the film may be normal or near normal, as in this situation. So this is an auxiliary view of the same person. So if you're looking at just an AP and you have a low level of clinical suspicion and you're trying to rule out just an anterior dislocation, you may look at the AP and even though it's not quite normal, may decide this person's okay, they haven't got an anterior dislocation. So traditionally, posterior dislocation was associated with things such as epileptic seizures, electrocutions, and electroconvulsive therapies. It is increasingly recognized as a result of trauma, and so can occur in sporting activities and accidents. 
So we see it in Australian football and rugby. So when players are holding a ball to their chest and falling heavily onto the ground, landing on the elbow, sometimes with an opponent or, or several opponents in their back. And so the humeral head can be forced posteriorly. In terms of management, there's really limited recommendations for management post dislocation at this stage. So it's considered that conservative management should be undertaken for three to six months following reduction if reduction is required, as long as there's no substantial fracture, rotator cuff tear or ongoing instability. So if you consider that even dislocations can be missed and the best management is unclear, what does that mean for translational instabilities? So we know instability really is a spectrum from people who just translate a little bit excessively right up to people who dislocate the joint. And we really don't have a great idea of the prevalence of that atraumatic or, or translational type posterior instability, but I do believe it is a common clinical presentation to physiotherapists and, and to sporting uh, sports medicine practitioners. And so to further understand the classification, assessment and management of posterior instability, there was a recent Delphi, Delphi study undertaken and that I contributed to along with 69 other shoulder people across the world. And the consensus in terms of classification was that there's th that three subgroups groups may exist, so including traumatic, microtraumatic and atraumatic posterior shoulder instability. So while these subgroups are, are headed by etiology or likely cause, they're really a collection of associated factors that contribute to presentation of that particular subgroup of instability. So traumatic instability, as, as we've discussed, it often involves an incident of significant trauma with the contact of the shoulder with an object or the ground or another player, and typically associated with a full dislocation and, and a unidirectional type instability. Whereas microtrauma instability is caused by tasks with repetitive or increased load. So this group may have structural lesions that have been acquired due to that repetitive microtrauma, and they can actually have one, two, or even three directions of instability of the shoulder. And then atraumatic um, has no seemingly um, obvious mechanism of injury or cause of onset, but is often associated with very poor scapular humeral, humeral head motor control, um, multiple directions of instability as well. Um, less likely to have structural lesions, but much more commonly have congenital factors such as generalized ligamentous laxity. And so, as I mentioned, uh, this condition is, is commonly misdiagnosed and a couple of the diagnoses that I see uh, are things such as impingement and AC joint pathology, really as a result of the excessive translation of the humeral head, causing either internal impingement of the glenoid or the acromion or even the AC joint, compression around the rotator cuff. And so this can cause similar type pains as, as impingement and AC joint pathologies. And also winging scapulae or, or reduced strength or, or poor strength of serratus anterior. And so, but basically this is um, a compensatory type mechanism that you see with posterior instability. So if you think about humeral head sliding posteriorly, then it's actually not a bad idea to bring your glenoid around and, and facing anteriorly so that you can um, oppose that humeral head movement posteriorly. And then the other condition is a type posterior capsule. And in fact, so that's the other end of the spectrum. So they're often misdiagnosed because they can be stiff, particularly with horizontal flexion type movements. So they're going to appear blocked and they often have trigger points through their, their posterior cuff as well. So the diagnosis can be complicated by a really high rate of congenital abnormalities. So things such as having a shallow glenoid, having a retroverted glenoid, or having some torsion in the humeral head. There can be the, the existence of a hypermobility type syndromes, and there does seem to be a high correlation with psychosocial factors, not uh, dissimilar to people with multidirectional instability as well. And so this is a really um, easy posterior, posterior instability that you can see this young man just comes out of the joint posteriorly there and as he comes back down you can see it pop back into the glenoid so that's in slow motion that's someone who actually subluxes out of the joint and so that's pretty clear but mostly they're not as clear as that <laughs> 
And so subjectively, they'll report they dislike loading, inflection, in horizontal flexion and internal rotation or any combinations of those movements. So the type of things they dislike, maybe pulling a top off, reaching across, reaching across for the seat belt, washing under their other arm. So turning a steering wheel, particularly if the steering wheel is quite large, um, lying on their side, but they often don't like lying on their other side because that horizontal flexion position is quite provocative. In younger athletes um, or anyone going to the gym, they often report they don't like pushing type exercises. So bench press, they may have pain with bench press or they just don't feel like they have a lot, a lot of strength with bench press and push-ups and any overhead type weights. They generally have trouble with weight bearing. So you might just they might describe having issues when they're doing things such as yoga. Um, they don't like anything with long lever flexion, so things such as um, front raises in the gym, for example. They can have pain at the front, which is sometimes a bit confusing, but that can be that compression, that internal um, impingement at the front. It can be the AC joint compression as well. And then they can describe a gripping or a tightening feeling in the back of the joint too. So keep in mind clinically that the rotator cuff test can actually be positive and that can contribute to the misdiagnosis as well. So the rotator cuff will working really hard to keep the humeral head enlocated in the glenoid and it can also be because the, the humeral head translation can cause compression of the cuff and we know compression is not great for tendon, tendon health. The acromioclavicular test may be positive as described, the AC joint can, can um, undergo some compression. They might have restricted range, but as noted, it's usually more guarding um, or it could actually be subluxing rather than a true stiffness. So what do we know about the clinical tests specific for posterior instability diagnosis? Well, there was um, a review done um, back in 2018, and so they identified five potential diagnostic tests. And in, but in terms of the evidence, they found only weak evidence exists for the use of the jerk tests and the Kim test, the posterior impingement sign, and an O'Brien's test as standalone tests for clinical um, examination of the post of posterior instability. So all of the included studies had a really high uh, risk of bias and the value of the test was not entirely clear. So clinically, um, I tend to use a, a dynamic posterior instability test. So getting the person to come across into horizontal flexion, describing any of their symptoms. So it's usually pain, can sometimes be stiffness, maybe um, neurological symptoms or clunking, clicking, anything like that. And then basically starting with a bit of a buffer at the back, you can see my fingers, getting them to do it again. So essentially just stopping that humeral head from, from sliding excessively posteriorly and retesting. So you'd hope to get some sort of a amelioration of their symptoms or at least a reduction of their symptoms and you can do this in any type of test and you may need to create um, a little bit more force so pushing up pushing out pushing in pushing forward or replicating the problem that they have so any functional test essentially that they're that they're describing they have problems with and then relocating that humeral head or stopping that translation and seeing if you can actually change the symptoms because that gives you a really good understanding of the value of rehabilitation and what actually their rehabilitation might, in, might involve and that they're translating excessively and that's part of their the issue. And so what of the management? So there was um, a systematic review done, uh, published back in 2016. Um, again, they found pretty low quality studies and they had very quite limited uh, recommendations because of that. They identified that if you have an atraumatic history, you have more favourable outcomes than the, with conservative management than those with a traumatic onset. They suggested that conservative rehabilitation should focus on rotating cuff and deltoid strengthening, uh, and this might actually reduce instability and recurrence of pain and increase function. And that scapular stabilisation may be important in terms of self-reported outcomes in the atraumatic population. And certainly the Delphi studies supported these findings and highlighted the importance of scapular stabilisation training and rotator cuff and deltoid strengthening for in their rehabilitation. <laughs> 
So a couple of years ago, we published our comprehensive poster instability rehabilitation program that includes an initial focus on scapular motor control and then leads into rotator cuff and deltoid strengthening and building um, then building functional capacity. So we try to include lots of pictures and goals for each stage. Um, so they try and be quite helpful. So if you are a clinician treating this condition, um, this, this article may be quite useful. Um, so, and we're currently undertaking some research on the efficacy of the program, but we did actually base this program on another program that we developed and, and looked at the efficacy of, so it wasn't just based on clinical expertise. And so the program was based on our multi-directional instability program that we pre previously published in two parts. And again, it's quite an extensive program that may be of value if you're, if you're managing MDI patients as well. And, and as I mentioned, we have evaluated, evaluated this scientifically. So the main difference in the posterior instability program was a larger emphasis on building the posterior muscular con control and strength. And so looking at the uh, evidence for our MDI program, we initially conducted a, a pre-post trial. So we had 43 patients with multidirectional instability. Um, they did a 12 week, this 12 week re rehabilitation program. And we found that they improved in terms of functional outcomes. So instability type, the patient reported instability scores. Um, they improved in their shoulder strength, as you would imagine, and improved in their scapular upward rotation, which is a big feature of the um, program. And then we looked at um, the program in a randomised control trial. So we compared this program with another um, published um, instability type program. So at the time of developing the program, the only other program out there was the Rockwood um, Rotated Cuff Deltoid Program. So we compared that with our uh, Watson program, which is much more scapular specific and leads into this overhead and functional type tasks. And when we looked at the results, so all of the group, as you can see, improved over time. The blue line indicates um, our program, the red indicates the Rockwood program. So measured on the Melbourne Instability Shoulder Scale, which is a patient specific reported outcome measure. Then at 24 weeks post the 12, well, they had a 12 week program and at 24 weeks, there was greater improvement in, in the MD, our MDI program. And similarly measured with the WASI, so the Western Ontario Shoulder Index at 12 12 weeks and 24 weeks, there was greater improvement in our MDI program. And same with pain, so you can see both groups improved in pain over time, um, but at 24 weeks, there was greater improvement with our program. And no difference between the groups in terms of muscle strength, scapular measures, satisfaction scores, a rebro, and the global rating of change. And we're currently uh, looking at a pre-post trial for our poster instability program. And as you can see, there's, it's showing good improvement. So at six weeks and then 12 weeks and 24 weeks, there's a significant improvement at baseline. And so we'll be looking at this further in the future. So the take home message is that shoulder, uh, the shoulder does not only dislocate anteriorly, that atraumatic posterior instability exists and causes shoulder dysfunction, so look out for it. Assessment and rehabilitation recommendation and guidelines are published and they're out there for access, but really we need further research um, to look at the efficacy and that is underway. So thank you very much again for, for having me um, and uh, I hope you found this valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tanya, for this uh, excellent presentation about posterior shoulder instability. Now, I'm honored to conclude uh, all the presentation with uh, a presentation that I'm assigned for, which is anterior shoulder instability, uh, diagnosis and treatment in athletes. So can we start? Yeah. Thank you. So I have nothing uh, to disclose. Today I'm going to talk about anatomy, epidemiology, mechanism of injury, history and physical exam in terms of evaluation, imaging and different modalities of imaging and shoulder instability and the management of anterior shoulder instability in athletes. So in 1990, Mastin et al. described the shoulder, described the shoulder and described the, uh, the, uh, defined the glenohumeral laxity as the ability of a humeral head to be passively translated on the glenoid fossa. He defined instability as a clinical condition in which unwanted translation of the head 
on the glenoid compromises the function and the comfort of the shoulder itself. The shoulder has a wide range of motion part, partially due to shallow glenoid and spherical humeral head. This inherently unstable configuration relies on other structure to prevent instability itself. This structure can be divided into static and dynamic shoulder stabilizers. So the shoulders, the static shoulder stabilizers are congruity, virgin and articulation, the bony structures, labrum, ligaments and negative pressure. The humerus itself has a 130 and 140 degree neck shaft angle and has a retroversion of a 25 to 30 degrees. The fossa itself has uh, seven degrees of retroversion, but it has 30 degrees of antiversion to the body itself, and this adds to the stability of the shoulder. The labrum itself increases the surface area, increases the depth of the socket up to five millimeter, and act as an anterior chalk block to the humeral head. Ligaments of the shoulder are also considered static stabilizers. It includes the superior glenohumeral ligaments, middle glenohumeral ligaments, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments, whether it's anterior band or posterior band, and all these static stabilizers act differently on different position of the shoulder. Negative pressure is also add to the stability of the shoulder, and uh, there is a study done by Gibbs et al. examining eight cadavers uh, shoulders and applying traction before and after venting, showing the role of negative pressure in shoulder stability. Now we're talking about dynamic shoulder stabilizers, which include all the muscles, rotator cuff, the biceps, and periscapular muscles. A rotator cuff acts as a humeral head depressor and increases the contact pressure between the humeral head and the glenoid, which increases the stability of the shoulder itself. Also, periscapular muscles are important scapular stabilizers in that they position the glenoid in an antiverted and superior position. Shoulder dislocation is the most common joint dislocation. It has 1.7 annual rate in general population, which is a lot. More than half of shoulder dislocation happen between uh, younger age population, 15 to 29 years old, and it has a 3 to 1 male to female ratio. Posterior shoulder dislocation account to 2 to 5% of all shoulder dislocations, and some studies show it's 10%. The mechanism of injury for anterior shoulder dislocation is usually anterior force to the arm when the shoulder is in abducted and external rotate, rotation. Posterior dislocation usually happen after high energy trauma, seizures, or electrocution. This is one of the videos that can show shoulder dislocation in basketball, NBA. And you can see here the left shoulder that shows anterior inferior fullness, a chromium that is prominent, and the position of the arm. It can happen also in football, as we can see here. You can see that player, the left shoulder, pain after a fall from height, direct on his arm. And the patient had anterior shoulder dislocation. Associated injuries, uh, it can happen, pancreas can happen up to 80% and 100%. Osseous pancreas can happen up to 40%. Also, patient can have perthes lesion, alpha lesion, which is anterior lateral periosseous sleeve avulsion, and the glenoid, or sorry, glad uh, lesion, which is a glenolateral articular defect. And this is the line of translation and finally dislocation, as you can see, to the anterior inferior aspect. In terms of evaluation, usually we start with history. We can know a lot by history, so we can categorize the type of instability, whether it's unilateral or bilateral complaint, family history, initial traumatic event, exact initial traumatic events, degree of trauma required to recurrence, dislocation during sleep, voluntary dislocation, uh, presence uh, of uh, and location of pain, if there is any sensory disturbance, and of course we have to ask about the sport activity. On physical exam for anterior acute anterior shoulder dislocation, usually we start with inspection, and usually the patient will present with anterior inferior fullness, loss of normal contour of the deltoid, prominent coracoid and acromion, and arm held in slight abduction and external rotation. In terms of palpation, patient will have generalized uh, tenderness, and usually will have fullness anteriorly. Patient will have decrease of uh, range of motion, and always, always, always document the neurovascular exam. 
In terms of uh, clinic, after reduction, usually uh, I start first with inspection, range of motion, and I start with this, uh, in terms of uh, special tests, I start with a sarcus sign where the patient is uh, in a, a sitting position, pulling the arm down and categorize it depending on the distance. Then I, I start to do, uh, then we start with the uh, anterior and posterior, uh, uh, anterior and posterior drawer test where the patient is in supine position and the affected arm is abducted 80 to 120 degrees with zero forward deflection, zero uh, external rotation, and hand of the examiner on the shoulder to stabilize the scapula. The other hand hold the humeral shaft, then apply anterior or posterior directed force to the shaft itself. Load and shift uh, with the patient is in supine position, abduction to 90 degrees, neutral rot rotation, and one hand apply axial load. The other hand apply anterior or posterior load on the humeral shaft. Then usually I measure the, uh, the grading of a humeral head translation from zero to three. Apprehension, relocation, and anterior release test is the most sensitive test. Several studies have shown that the production of pain upon laxity testing doesn't confirm a diagnosis of shoulder instability. And uh, Spiritel in 1994 found that the production of pain on apprehension relocation test has accuracy of less than 50% and increased to more than 80% if apprehension was used as a positive test. Uh, we, we always uh, have to measure the general laxity testing, patent score, and then after uh, history and physical exam, we go directly to x-rays. I uh, usually start with, uh, uh, or acutely, we start with AP, through AP, and axillary review, and the shoulder can't be deemed relocated until we have, uh, uh, until axillary review confirmed that. With point of view and the assessment for more uh, uh, chronic uh, shoulder instability, additional views are also helpful, such as with point of view, and it can show a bony uh, uh, bankard fracture, and striker notch view to identify if there is any hill sack, Garth view also to identify for a bony uh, bank cut. CT scan can be done if the patient's uh, uh, to assess the, the amount of uh, uh, sac, uh, how big it is, the, if there is any bony bank cut, and if there is also a lock dislocation cannot be reduced. MRI used to identify soft tissue injuries associated with shoulder dislocation. Intraarticular contrast is important to view the extent of labral injury and to identify Hagel. As we can see here, the bank cut lesion. Here is the Hagel lesion and the J sign of it. Here the patient is having alpha, where the labrum is really healed medially. And this is glad with articular uh, lesion. And this is paired with the elevation of the labrum. Glenohumeral humoral instability classification can be classified in terms of degree, whether it's dislocation, subluxation, or micro instability. Direction, unidirectional, bidirectional, multidirectional, frequency, and etiology, whether a tra traumatic, a traumatic, or acquired. And if the patient comes in at the beginning with the dislocation, uh, there are several techniques to reduce the uh, to reduce the shoulder. One of them that I usually use is traction and counter traction, and you need to be done in like an emergency. Stimson technique and also Milch technique. After reduction, patient is going to be immobilized for a while. And studies showed that there is no difference in immobilization between external rotation versus internal rotation after primary anterior shoulder dislocation. Redislocation rate, uh, re redislocation rate range from 45% to 100% depending on many factors. The decision of surgery for the first time dislocators is still controversial and non-surgical management continues to be the initial treatment of choice despite the increasing acceptance of surgical treatment of at-risk patients who are first-time dislocators. This is a study done by Eric uh, J. Strauss uh, uh, concluded that arthroscopic pancreas repair resulted in sevenfold lower recurrence rate and the higher rate of return to play compared to conservative treatment. Thus, arthroscopic pancreas repair may be advisable to perform routinely in the first time dislocators who participate in sport. The decision of surgery and instability depends on many factors, presence of bony lesion, other soft tissue injuries, failure of a previous surgery, chronic or acute setting. For options of surgery, we have soft tissue procedures such as arthroscopic pancreas repair, open pancreas repair. For bony injury, we can do open J, arthroscopic J, reemblissage, humeral head augmentation, and arthroplasty. Comparing arthroscopic pancreas repair, it can be done on lateral position or beach chair, a preferred over open technique because it allows detailed diagnosis, less post-op pain, improved cosmesis, and no disruption of subscapularis.
and it can done by different uh, technique, whether it's uh, with the knots or knotless. And recent study shows no difference between them. For small bony bank cartilage of less than 20%, we still can use the bony bank cartilage technique arthroscopically. So results of arthroscopic bank cartilage repair, reduced location rate is similar to open surgery. The recurrent, recurrent instability of 7% and 90% of patients return to pre-injury level of activity. For post-op rehab, I usually keep the patient on a sling for five weeks, then start active and range of motion after that for 12 weeks, then uh, 12 to 24 weeks strength training. I use risk, uh, ISIS uh, score to decide whether, the, uh, whether an arthroscopic surgery to be done or not on patient with a glenohumeral instability. So for me, in a score of more than six, presto laryngeal surgery is indicated. The risk of recurrence was found to be 3% in a score of three or less, 10% in a score of six or less, and 70% in a score of seven or more. So when do we start to think about different procedures uh, other than arthroscopic bank heart repair? If we have significant glenoid defect, significant health secondary, failure of a prior arthroscopic procedure, or ISIS score of more than six. A lot of studies done to measure when we upgrade surgery from arthroscopic bank after repair to bony procedure, and loss of 20% of anterior glenoid rim has been shown to significantly reduce the force required for anterior glenohumeral translation and increase the chance of redislocation. There are several techniques to measure uh, uh, the glenoid bone loss. There is a, a bare spot uh, technique that can be done arthroscopically, and also the best fit circle that's, uh, that can be done uh, with a CT scan. After deciding on bony procedure, what type of bony procedure that we go for? Do we go for a classical, congruent arc, or a presto? So uh, at Wally Tal did a nice study comparing laryngeal to presto technique. And the finding was that the laryngeal procedure results in a more stable shoulder in a cadaveric study. Also, Rossi et al. in 2020 compared the congruent arc to classical technique, and they found that both classical and congruent arc laryngeal have excellent outcome with no intergroup difference. So the post-op protocol for uh, laryngeal procedure is uh, uh, sling for four weeks, that's for me, and the range of motion and passive then active for four to 10 weeks and strengthening 10 to 15 weeks. And these are uh, uh, some of the excess that we do here. Uh, sometimes I use uh, uh, two screws and sometimes uh, one screw, depending on the size of the uh, coracoid. And of course, with any surgery, complication can happen. It could be infection, hematoma, shoulder pain with the 2% incidence of screw removal, osteoarthritis, recurrence, neurovascular injury, and range of motion limitation. And we always think about our patients, especially young patients when we do LRJ, we think about osteoarthritis and the risk of recurrence, especially in uh, contact uh, and sport and contact uh, 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 contact sport. This is one of our patients that done like uh, the surgery uh, Larry J five to six uh, years ago. Uh, we found out that the bony position was uh, excellent. There was no um, um, uh, fracture of uh, of the bony procedure or the screw. We decided to go arthroscopically identify the coracoid position, and uh, after that we uh, we were able to do a, a reemblissage for this patient, as you can see in the right uh, picture, and we fixed uh, also what uh, uh, what left of uh, of the labrum and the capsule, and we did the closure of uh, rotator interval. Another case of one patient who had seizures, uh, dislocated after uh, multiple seizures and bending the screws, we were able to do a, a reemblissage for this patient arthroscopically first, then we ended up on doing a uh, distal tibial uh, allograft for this patient with two screws. This is the post-op x-rays and patients is doing great after. Other bony uh, injuries and managements uh, that we have to think about are health sacs. So it's osseous defects at the humeral head present 40 to 90% of all first time dislocators and nearly 100% in recurrent dislocators. And it's usually uh, present in posterior superior lateral position. So we have to think when we think about health sac lesion, we have to think about the lesion itself. Is it an engaging or not engaging? And is it on track? or off a track. And usually it's very important to know how medially it is from the rotator cuff itself. Uh, to measure the health sac, uh, usually there are different uh, techniques and usually I use the best fit circle. And depending on the size of the health sac and whether it's on track or off a track or whether it's engaging or not engaging, then we can decide on surgery itself. 
So this infection is indicated in acute lesion less than three weeks and less than 40%. Reemblissage for defects from 20 to 25% that are engaging. Humeral head bone augmentation for defects more than 25%. Resurfacing for more than 40% and hemiarthroplasty that's rarely done for more than 40% defect size in patients older than 65 or low demand patients. Zinning Lee uh, did a systematic uh, review uh, in Boston in 2018 concerning return to sport after anterior shoulder stabilization uh, and showed that 97% uh, patients return to sport after bankart, arthroscopic bankart, 83% after open allergy. Time to return to sport for arthroscopic bankart was exactly 5.9 months and open allergy was five months. Take home message, anterior shoulder stability is common on field management and reduction is a must. Athletes who are first time dislocators are more likely to have further instability. Decision of surgery depends on patient factors, kind of sport and the presence of other bony lesions. Return to sport is excellent if it's treated early. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to uh, questions. Let's start with uh, Dr. Bashir Zakaria. Uh, the first question is about uh, uh, AC joint separation. So do you always, uh, uh, after like a chronic uh, injury for a patient and needed a reconstruction, uh, what do you do exactly for the AC joint itself after removal? I, I don't do a distal clavicle anymore. I don't take the distal clavicle out at all. Uh, if I have to, I take a little bit if I have a trouble reducing it. But then I just kind of cross, I, I take my ligament, I, take my ligament, I fix it I on fix the it for the CC the... ligaments, and I cross it longitudinally, one limb over the top and one limb, more of a posterior superior repair. And I usually either put an anchor or sew it into the periosteum, but I usually put an anchor and then I just tie it down onto an anchor on the acromion. So I, I, I'd like to cross the AC joint, making sure I have something on the superior aspect and more posterior superior as I can. Another question for Dr. Bashir. So, Dr. I will just give you a moment. Uh, what's the rate of complication for operation of distal clavicle type 2 uh, and more on dominant arm? I think you mean like maybe type 3, like uh, surgical. Uh, uh, distal clavicle unstable, right? Uh, yes. I think the rate of complications go anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. It's just similar to the AC joint, but if you use if you do it correctly, you know, some people use a hook plate. I'm not a big fan of the hook plate because it's two surgeries. But if you use a pre-contoured plate and it's some type of terminal uh, fixation, you know, cerclage or a terminal suspension device, you can decrease the complication. But again, it's a learning curve, right? If you do it open, you can actually pass it around. But if you do it arthroscopically, it's, it's a learning curve. So the literature shows anywhere from 22% to 30%, depending on what you read. But I think if you get the learning curve up, it can bring it down pretty low. I mean, I honestly, in the beginning, I was concerned, but now... I don't really worry about the complications as much, especially with a distal clavicle fracture because you get bone to bone healing. Mm -hmm. With the AC joint, you're always going to have some loss of reduction and some instability in the horizontal plane, but I think you should still be okay. But mostly, uh, I think in distal clavicle fractures because you get bone to bone healing, you should be okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Batoni, uh, there is a question for you. Uh, when do you consider the patient candidate for superior capsular reconstruction? Yeah, the superior capsular reconstruction was developed not that long ago for what would be an irreparable rotator cuff tear, specifically supra. The, the, it's super actually the, the procedure, for those who don't know what a superior capsular reconstruction or an SCR is, is, is actually the um, imposition of or, or position of a, a tissue using an allograft, a dermal allograft, uh, between the glenoid and the um, uh, footprint on the humerus thereby reproducing a uh, superior capsular uh, trampoline effect and what it uh, contraction which would shorten the distance uh, from the humerus to the acromion to convert it into an abduction. So the patient will actually um, benefit in abduction by this uh, uh, surgical procedure. And, and the, the question was, you know, what point do we do we go to an SCR? An S for someone who doesn't have glenohumeral arthritis, thereby an indication for reverse total shoulder, and someone who has an irreparable rotator cuff but wants to regain some active abduction. 
unfortunately, it's not been very good for very um, young patients or very athletic patients to return to sport. So it's really a, a, a procedure that has been better for an older patient who doesn't have arthritis but has an irreparable rotator cuff tear. Thank you, Dr. Batoni. Uh, for uh, Dr. Kaplan, uh, Dr. Tanya, sorry, I will ask you this question again. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, uh, when do you consider patients failed conservative treatment and posterior shoulder stability? Well, thank you for the question. Um, well, I think if they're unable to get back to their sporting activity, if it's a young person, uh, if they're still having ongoing symptoms, um, subluxations through range, if they're having, particularly if they're having ongoing pain, uh, then despite having completed a good conservative program and being adherent to that program, then I think, you know, then they're, they're a surgical candidate then, essentially. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tanaka, another question for you. Uh, you know that uh, in the Middle East, uh, we don't play a lot of uh, baseball, so we don't have a lot of throwers, but we have goalkeepers and, and, and soccer, football. Uh, what would you do for a patient who had a slab tear, let's say type two, who have, uh, uh, who's a goalkeeper? Would you do a slab repair? Would you do a bicep stenosis? And how do you choose that? Uh, so for my practice, you know, I've primarily moved away from repairs and I really lean heavily towards tenodesis um, for two reasons. One is that I, th at least in my practice, it's pretty uncommon for me to see an, an isolated slab tear that doesn't have some sort of uh, bicipital groove pain or tenderness. And so I think it addresses that. And then secondly, you know, with the literature shifting towards uh, supporting this and with the outcomes, uh, I feel more comfortable doing this in younger patients. Uh, so in, in my hands, this would be a uh, subpectoral tenodesis. Uh, actually, another question. Uh, uh, so we know like bicep tenodesis has different uh, technique. Uh, do you feel like there is a difference between subpectoral and uh, what we call it lube and tack uh, technique intraarticular uh, fixation? Uh, even though they say like uh, it decreased the tension on the bicipital groove and decreased the pain. In your practice, did you find any differences between them? Yeah, so I uh, do um, primarily subpec, um, and I think that the groove pain is a real issue. Um, and I know that there are some good results that people have with intraarticular tenodesis, but again, you know, when the patients do have residual groove pain, it's it's a real nuisance. And so I just uh, go to the subpec every single time uh, to not have that problem afterwards. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank all our uh, presenters and uh, speakers uh, for today's uh, uh, presentations. Uh, we really appreciate that and I want to greet all our audience from all over the world. Thank you very much and uh, good night. Thank you.